so where should I don't know, we'll have to kind of figure out where that's going to be after we get to the end.
come out the heart, we call it. The other 36 will die, will go insane, or will go to jail. Now, I know a lot of you have absolutely no idea who I am. It's quite a lot of I'm glad I got the tape, because I, I can remember that I did play. And TV38 kind of sums up my whole life in eight minutes. I thought I'd have thought much more than that, but I didn't know. And I'm two parts of this tape I want you to pay attention to. One is, so notice that the commentator is going to mention that I got traded to the never got along with coaches, and I got traded again to the never got along with management, and I was traded again to the never got along with teammates. Well, that is a contraindication of the use of the drug alcohol. And because alcohol is a drug, and a poison, and an anesthetic, and a sedative, it causes mood swings, because its sole purpose is to suppress feelings and emotions. And in these mood swings, come, become, the more you drink, the more belligerent your behavior gets. Now, to understand the mood swing, you have to understand each other's behavior. We all know somebody in a class, or a friend, or whatever, who's a super good kid all week. A real nice person, nice to be around. We all know people that we say, well, he's a great kid when he's sober, but a jerk when he's drunk. Those are the mood swings. Somebody will be a, a being quiet all week long on Friday night, having a few drinks, or being quiet, you can't shut him off. As soon as he has a few drinks, away he goes. You have another type, usually the male. Boy, is quiet, terrified of girls. Not ask anybody to do anything. Get a few drinks in him though, he's a hustler. All of a sudden he's smooth, lets us dance, lets do whatever. But he can't talk to girls unless he's drinking. You know that type. Then we got, usually this guy is not very big. He's a quiet, timid, shy kid, good kid. And he has a few drinks. He wants to beat up the world. He's a tough guy. All of a sudden he's going to beat up somebody six foot six. Oh yeah, you don't care. How long does that take? There's another part in this little table I want you to realize. There's a contrary, the second contraindication to use the drug alcohol is eventually you will black out. Now anyone here who has ever blacked out, you have a problem. It isn't that difficult to understand. Social drinkers do not black out, ever. Only problem drinkers and alcoholics do. And they are the only three types of drinkers in the world. Social, problem, and alcohol. Now, if you've ever forgotten how you got home, or you ever drank and forgot how much you said, or how you behaved, or what you did, or where you parked your car, and you blacked out. And I'm doing an interview. I bought a horse ranch. I don't know why I bought a horse ranch. But I'm there and then this guy could fly. I'm going to do a TV interview, five minutes. He ended up doing an hour special. I was drunk. It was 9 o'clock in the morning. He got there at 1 8 he woke me up, I started drinking straight whiskey. I've been doing cocaine for a couple of days. I was blacked out, I'm stoned, I'm puffy, I'm sick, I'm obnoxious. I'm... And I don't just want you to see this Eric Sanderson man, the long hair, the best, cocky, arrogant, know it all, smart out of big mouth, sitting there, thinking I had everything together. I was in a black. I was at that point of the jam. And those are the two things I want you to pay attention to. Now the tape's over, we're going to, yeah, who's going to run? Who's going to run? Okay. That's good. I'm not very technically inclined, never was. And then we're going to talk about alcoholism and how it took over my life. How it can easily take over yours. We have the questions and answers if we have time. We got this water man. How was the time to like? Eric Sanderson was 21 years old when he left Niagara Falls, Ontario to join the Boston Bruins. 
In his first season, he was voted the NHL's Rookie of the Year, and his future looked bright. Sanderson wasn't a scorer. He was more of a defensive specialist. His tough, aggressive play epitomized the Boston Bruins of his era. However, during his first five seasons with the Bruins, he was gaining more notoriety off the ice than on. His flamboyant lifestyle, playboy image, and business association with Joe Namath in the Bachelor's Three Bar all combined to make him a media and fan favorite. So much so, that the World Hockey Association's Philadelphia Blazers lured him away from Boston in the summer of 72 with an unheard of multi-million dollar contract with the hope that he might generate the fan and media attention the fledgling World Hockey Association was desperate for. After playing only seven games for Philadelphia, Sanderson injured his back and because of a personality conflict with management, he never returned to the Philadelphia lineup. By January 1973, he was back in Boston, but things had changed. There was resentment from some of his teammates for leaving Boston, and another personality conflict with the Bruins coach. After a year and a half, it was time to move on. First stop, New York. Sanderson played well in the Big Apple, but another personality conflict had developed, this time with the Ranger coach. Next stop, St. Louis. Sanderson had his best year ever, but the Blues had financial problems and couldn't afford his salary, and he was sold to Vancouver. This was a brief stop. He finished the 76-77 season with the Canucks, but his hockey future looked bleak. Booze, drugs, and a personality problem made Sanderson a hot potato for team managements. I've always gotten along with people in press. My problem is getting along with management. Now they want to play that is supposed to be uh, colorful and that gets press and can, well, press is the name of the game, it keeps the game alive. Without the press people, you're dead. Uh, then an athlete gets no money, he gets nothing. But now they're trying to uh, uh, put people in the building with uh, brawls and, and, uh, and fights and uh, violence and they're trying to advertise this. But if you get involved in one, they won't, they won't back you, you know, they won't, they won't, they're contradictory. On one hand, they say one thing, on the other hand, they try to discipline them. Well, well, either give me a free hand or uh, leave me alone. I was uh, pretty loose. I had, uh, I tell you, you know, they all, the people think they're all beautiful, you know? See, there were some, there were some real dogs in there. There was some real uh, service elevator material, I'll tell you. Here's the key. Bring me in the room. Don't let any of the guys know. Sneak away in 15 minutes. But, you know, uh, that was another way to occupy my time and kill time. And you get, you get so much time as a hockey player, and like you only practice an hour and a half a day, and geez, you get like 20, 20 hours to fill. And like, I'm not a sleeper. I don't like to go to sleep. I like to just go. I go to like collapse. And sometimes I collapse, and it's 8 o'clock at night, and it's hockey time. It's time to play the game, and I'm collapsed. It's pretty well all said and done. Uh, we're at twilight of a mediocre career. Vancouver released Sanderson, and he tried a comeback with Detroit and Pittsburgh, but it wasn't in the cards. One of the most colorful careers in professional hockey was over. During the next three years, he drifted aimlessly, blowing his money, and trying to outrun reality with drugs and booze. Well, I, when I tried to rob the guy, was bottle. <laughs> and uh, that's when I realized I'd had it. And I said, geez, I'm down, I'm down trying to beat a wine for his bottle. And then I was a drunk myself. I'm thinking he was less of a person than me. And then I said, what am I talking about? I'm knocking this guy, and I'm as bad off as he is. I'm in the same place he is, and I am knocking him. And that's when my ego just decided, hey, get way out of hand here. And uh, I said to the guys, you know, do you know who I am? <laughs> what a stupid statement to make to a drunk. They said, yeah, I know you are. You're a drunk, just like me. And that's when it hit me, and I said, well, oh, I need help. In his mid-30s, Sanderson was again the focus of media attention. He had overcome his dependency on alcohol and drugs, but he was broke and crippled. I had colitis in 1970, 71, and I took what was then prescribed as a wonder drug. It was, uh, it was authorized, it was done in the Mass General Hospital uh, to give me my strength back, blood count, and prednisone was the name of it, and it's a cortisone steroid family. 
but it hadn't passed the test of time. It had only passed FDA examining at that point, so they, they let it go. Ten years down the road, it causes bone death. That now they know. They took it off the market, relabeled it. Five hip surgeries later, it's a spreading disease that goes either now it goes either my knees or my shoulders. That's just something that I have to deal with. Sanderson has made a remarkable recovery. Three years ago, his first set of hip transplants failed. His left leg was paralyzed. He was unable to look after himself, and the medical bills were piling up. His future was again looking bleak, but a friend, Tony Ziza, took him in, and with the help of the NHL, Sanderson had a second set of hip transplants. Now with the aid of a cane, he works for the city of Boston, lecturing at inner city schools on alcohol and drug abuse, a subject he is an expert on. within that by the rules of the street. Now they have to, under the rules of the street, protect their own, right? Stay with your friends, all right? Maybe you gotta stick the eye first and also off for protection. Just for the rules. And now, outside of that, it's us with the laws. You break these, you're going to jail. On top of all that pressure, they got that pressure. They're going to jail if they break our laws. They break their laws, they're dead. That's too much pressure for a 12-year-old kid to do it. They're hanging on the corner, or they're bored, or they're scared, or, and they'll try it. They'll experiment, and for that moment of high, they can hide. But eventually, you have to come back to reality. And I was just kept on trying to stay in the fantasy land. When I saw the, the beginning of the end, I just started to drink so I could forget that it was all, I was on my way out. And it's just, I, I could have extended my career if I hadn't drank, but I... I wasn't going to listen to anybody, and I just certainly didn't take anyone's advice. And I did it my way, and I got beat for it. The years of despair and defeat were not the end for Derek Sanderson, and he was not beaten. Today, he has forged a new beginning, and is once again a winner. His interest and involvement in hockey continues. A popular sports commentator on Nessa and Channel 38, Derek does color commentary alongside me, Fred Kizik, for Boston Bruins games. And each year, through a regional program called Derek's Picks, he discovers and encourages the promising talents of young hockey players throughout New England. His major commitment is to community service. For three years, he served as the head of Browning Ferris Industries' drug and alcohol abuse program. Now he has joined the firm of Tucker Anthony in Boston and is continuing his work with young people directing Tucker Anthony's drug and alcohol awareness program, Tucker Anthony Cares. His powerful talks on the dangers of drug and alcohol abuse reach thousands of junior and senior high students. Following the talks, students are able to meet with him personally, to ask questions, to find out about the many agencies that are available to them if they have a problem. Derek Turk Sanderson is no longer the famous superstar, the highest paid athlete of an era, idolized by millions. But in his work with young people, he has discovered greater rewards and deeper satisfactions than he ever knew in his meteoric hockey career. Derek Sanderson has made the right choice, the only choice, a drug-free life. And that's his message. Derek Sanderson cares. And his message is making a difference. Okay, uh, that's it. Now, I didn't...
violence, dislikes, resentments, rejections, embarrassment. You learn it every day how to deal with people. Those are social skills you learn every day. But the right thing and the wrong thing to do. Behavioral patterns that will serve you well for the rest of your life. So when you do become successful later in life, you'll be able to handle it. I just wanted to be a hockey player, and that's all I was. I was just an athlete who thought maybe I was special. Athletes are not special. Athletes are people. They hurt, they cry, and they feel like anybody else. But I thought because I was physically strong and coordinated, I didn't have to be as nice a person as you're supposed to be. And I thought my fame and my glory would get things done, get things done for me. Well, after a while, that doesn't work. I drank at 70, seven times until I was 20 years old when I turned pro with the Boston Bulls. And when I was in Boston, my rookie year, I would look at a beer and I'd pop. Everybody drank, everything was fun. I mean, you guys are convinced that the night belongs to Michael. No. I mean, you're intelligent people. You're probably the top 10% intelligent people in the world. Right here in this room. And they got three, and Hunter Bush has got three gorgeous girls running around with this very ugly dog. Telling you when to say when. You're listening to a dog. <laughs> a black guy, too. Probably got that in a bar of a Bud McKenzie. He got a truck now, shows up on the beach. Palm trees come out. All of a sudden, all these beautiful girls show up. I don't know about the wise in the world. No beautiful girl ever showed up with it. But Anheuser Bush, who lives to believe it does, the hangovers come, the trouble come, the trees come, the throw up come. I didn't know that. I just looked at a beer and said, oh, well, okay, I'll have you have a beer. Come on, you gotta have a beer. Come down. And I'd sit and I'd nurse it. And then I'd learn to maybe drink two my second year. My third year, I could drink five. As long as it was really, really cold. I mean, nobody in their right mind drinks warm beer. I mean, they even got a heart. Cold beer. Why? It's a taste brutal. You have to try to taste. Oh yeah. I'd sit there and nurse these beers. I might I might fifty I could drink eight or nine. I might sixty I was into the hard stuff. Get drunk quicker. I'll get caught saying one beer, one shot of whiskey, one seven ounce glass of wine, it's all the same. No different. Body doesn't know any different. I've built a tolerance to this drug. I just learned to drink somebody under the table. Now, in fact, anyone here in this room can drink your friends under the table, you're an alcoholic. They've already built a tolerance to it. If you can function with a lot of alcohol in your system, you're a drunk. Social drinkers have food that it must get tipsy. That's normal. Drunks are the ones that sit down and serious drinking. Let's get down to some serious drinking. That's a problem. That's an attitude problem. I didn't know that. I used to think I was cool. I think I was fun. I used to get drunk as a scotch. And then I turn out and fuck you up and fuck with And you're down at your knees holding onto a toilet. I'm coming to fall. This is great. Yeah. This is fun. It's, I'll throw a ball with your shirt and sweat. Yeah. And you go talk to a girl. <laughs> the only girl that got back in that condition is someone who's just as drunk as you are. <laughs> Being drunk is only overdosed on drug alcohol. Alcoholism, the ism part, is addiction to the drug alcohol. Cocaineism, marijuanaism, perganaism, valianism—those things. A drug is a drug. It's all the same. I didn't know that. I was told by a woman in business. 
this, everything was fun and no problems. Had a ton of money and I'm drinking and company says, you know, try this. I tried drugs. From trying drugs for four years later, I was broke and sitting under bridges with a gun in my hand. Trying to figure out how I got there. I got on my knees one day and said, God, help me. I cannot control this anymore. I'm finished. I'm cruel. I'm beat. You win. But okay. Thought came to my mind. Something my father told me when I was young. He said, if you ever get scared, don't panic. Panic will kill you. That does not to ask for help. Ask for help. I don't even know where to ask for help. Today, that isn't the case. Kids got counselors in this school. You've got community groups. But all you have to do is have the courage to ask for help. You see, when I was as an athlete, I learned to do was to learn to deal with physical pain very well. Physical pain comes and goes. You break your arm and deal with okay, it hurts for a while. But emotional pain, huh? That I never dealt with very well. That I thought, that I stayed away from, that I was terrified of. I was terrified of rejection, embarrassment, being laughed at, being picked on. So, I said, I got to get help. I went to a friend of mine who was a drug dealer. And that was his lifestyle. He said, Daddy, you got to go to the detox. I've never heard of the detox. I didn't know what a detox was. A detox is a place where you go to a sponge poison from your body. Why? Because you talk about the drugs poison for your system. Okay. Detox is a case. You can sponge your poison. Okay. I go there. Manhattan detox. It's not a pleasant place. The cockroaches in the place have a union eye, they carry it right out of it. And they crawl on a little bit, you're so going, who's this? <laughs> and he's laying there in the front bed playing games with him. <laughs> She's not normal behavior. <laughs> and they take your clothes and take your belts, you don't hang yourself. Because I was suicidal, they do it. Part of the game, part of the process. Anyway, I'm there, the guy says you're alcoholic and you're addicted to 11 different drugs. 11 drugs? I don't know 11 drugs. If I had an exam, I'd write down 11 drugs, couldn't do it. He said, well, you're probably drunk, blacked out, and taken when anybody did you. Uh -huh. He says, you're one sick kid. He says, you're very toxic. Your system is extremely toxic. Uh -huh. Nice term, didn't want to man. So I figured toxic, poison, you know, okay. combination of all the stuff. I said, I don't know, I'll load it up in this detox. Must be a combination of all the booze and the drugs. I'll get out of here and just drink beer. Beer's fine, beer's okay, beer's fine. Tell no, you what, get out of the detox, drink beer, go. Short period of time, I find myself in another detox. I go, wow. I must be allergic to beer. <laughs> okay, I'm not allergic to detox to drink vodka. I got off the boat, I'm going to Can't believe it, I'm allergic to vodka. I'll just drink wine. Now the detox. So, wow, that's it, I'm allergic to alcohol. I'll just do okay. <laughs> I'll just smoke over. Anyway, I ended up in 13 different detoxes. You take it down with your right now, hallucinating, withdrawing, with pain, sickness. Now, when I used to hallucinate detox, you can take your worst nightmare, and that's like watching Alice in Wonderland. That's, that's like watching Peter Pan. Because when you're getting a detox, and you're hallucinating, and you're withdrawing, wow. Period. Or your brain picks you. I get out of there, I get in the 13th one. I'm sick, I'm beat up, I'm tired, I'm 150 pounds of passion. I gained a little weight since then. Okay. I quit smoking 22 days ago. I eat constantly. So, I don't feel very good. Guys, is over here. Comfort, recovering alcohol, looks 
circumstances. How many of these have you been in since by 13 one? Because you think you're going to learn. But what you're not prepared to do, you don't know how to live. That's, well, that's what scares you. You don't know how to live. I said, well, how do you do that? She said, you got to grow up. I said, grow up? What do you think you grow up? I said, I'm 34 years old. She said, no, but you have to go back to when you first drank over something. I didn't drink over anything. I just drank. It was a normal procedure. But no, you drank for a reason. He goes, in the growing up process, he says, what you have to do is get honest with yourself. Huh? He said, tell you what, try to get honest with me. You will not lie to me. Anyone here can put themselves to the same process as counselor of what we do. All of you here drinking, and all the people here that are doing drugs, you can put yourselves to the same process. Why? Do you use you? And I told the guy, quite honestly, I don't know. And he said, okay, let's get to the bottom of it. Immaturity, inability to cope, fear of rejection, fear of embarrassment, we're all part of it. I know, okay. He said, how old are you? He said, no, let's try this process. How old were you the first time you drank? First time I drank. I was funny. He said, listen, you promised to be honest with you. I'm a total stranger, I'm not here to judge you. How old were you the first time you drank? I said, no, no, 20, 21. He goes, I don't know the first time you got drunk a couple of nights in a row. What was the first time you drank? I said, oh, okay. 17. Uh, go on and be honest with me. I had some friends with me, I could drink 30 draft beers in 30 minutes when I was 15. They tell us to behave that, isn't it? I guess it is. No one told me about wet brain. And anybody wants to find out about wet brain, ask your health teacher. She can teach you that. Counselor can tell you what wet brain is. It's a condition called caused from rapid alcohol consumption. Your body and your brain is really one alcohol. You drink too much too fast. Calcium deficiency. Uh, first time I saw a case of wet brain, Jesus stunning. And there's no coming back from it. You're like that for life. Check it out. Now, he said, that's the first time you got drunk there. I the first time you drank. I said, well, listen, I had three beers and I was 12. Does that come? He said, yeah, of course it comes. Is that your first beer? I said, no. I tell you the truth, I have one on seven. That come? Yeah. You know, I asked you to get honest with yourself. Get honest with me. You promised me you would. But he said, 20. I tried to lose what I got you when I was seven years old. He said, I never thought about it before. He goes, uh -huh. And that's the process of getting honest. Tell me how it happened. Why did you drink it? Curiosity, pressure, what? Uh, I said, I don't know, it's Christmas, my uncle came in and said, hey, whoa. I seen him once a year, my uncle Warney. Nice guy. Never saw him sober, so I didn't know he was drunk. He said, hey, wow, you're getting big. I said, I am. It's true. That's good. All I know is looking up to people. This high. How old are you when you're seven? He says, here, you're big enough to drink. I had a conference with you do that. I said, well, that's okay. So what was your first impression of the drug alcohol? I never really looked at alcohol as a drug before. So it was beer. That's not a drug. I said, the beer is the drug alcohol. What was your first impression of the drug? Well, you're seven years old, you smell it like that. Before you eat it or drink it. So I smelled it. Ooh, the beer stinks. Oh, socks, cool, cool, thanks, black. So I am. So, tell the kid that I was, how do I have a pet? Most of us great drinkers hold our pet before we drink our beer. Six? No, beer doesn't tell you, hey, drink last night, you smell good, too. 
big enough or old enough, just work. I'm all grown up, I'm set. Food. <laughs> and take it. Hold my breath, fire it back. Food, food, food. Now I'm good. Social drinkers, by the way, sit. Problem drinkers and alcoholics swallow.
Jesus. Two extra beers, 
The key is three minutes. Is three drinks, ninety minutes. Three beer, ninety minutes. It's the time. You're okay. Stop and go. Turn the blood stream. Eventually, where do you go? You have to go to the brain. Blood's going to go there. And if you bring someone, get hey, out. Here comes drug alcohol. Perfect. Let's get numb. <laughs> Why? Because you need the ability of the brain cell to handle the drug like a sponge. Absorbs the drug alcohol like a sponge. And when alcohol is in the brain cell, forces the brain cell to overproduce, double the production of inhibitors. Inhibitors are neuron messages sent to the central nervous system. And you relax. Yeah. I mean, nobody's going to beat you up. You're still scared because you don't feel it, so you don't care. You got debts, you got problems, but you're drunk, you don't care. Problems don't go away. Your girlfriend still dumps you, but she don't care. So, now you have the four problems. Well, three in 90 minutes, you're impaired. Impaired decision making is what now gets you in a ton of trouble. You gotta get to because impaired means I hate coordination and all that nonsense. We all know that just slows up a little bit. But we still think we can drink and drive, we can function, we can walk, talk, do things, and be normal. But you've altered your personality with these three drinks. Now you see, you're impaired. Also, in your decision making, your logic, and your common sense. You no longer found your decisions, base your decisions. On your behavior, your morals, your values, your principles. You now follow on drug affected emotions. So now, you don't care about anybody. You get rude, you get vulgar, you get ignorant, you get belligerent. You turn into a class clown, you turn into the village idiot. You make people laugh at you instead of with you. You try to impress your acquaintances. Try to show up, you get sick, you get dumb. The big thing is you now are beginning to nullify certain aspects of your behavior. You're anesthetized your throat, you justify the use of the fourth drink. What does the fourth one do? Nah. That fourth beer is magic. That fourth beer begins to nullify fear. And we all have fear. When I was your age, I used to think fear was scared. <coughs> scared was weak. Weak was weak. Not so. Fear is something that is essential in your lifetime. Fear is intelligence. Fear is God's way of keeping you tender about something that won't harm you. Fear is what makes you pay attention to rules and regulations. Fear is the foundation for civilized behavior. You are, if you have fear, you are patient, kind, understanding, warm, considerate. You nullify fear. You are exactly like Anheuser Bush says you are. You are the party animal because you are no longer civilized. You now have fear nullified, prepared decision making. Loss of common sense and logic, you begin to nullify your morals. Your values are no longer there. Your sexual attitude is no longer there. But your morals and principles and values are, are now come to mind. Impaired decision making, no fear. Somebody at a dance, a party, whatever says to you, here, try this. That isn't you any longer. Let me try this. Try what? Oh, uh, drugs out of blue drugs. It's just one person who's drunk. Drunk. Ah, oh, yeah, no, but I just drink. Try it. You'll like this. Try it. It's better. It's quicker. You don't have bad breath. You don't get hung over. You don't get sick from it. You're trying. You go, man. Drink some more. Drink some more. Next weekend, next month, next year. College. You're drinking, see? got no safety mechanisms in place. Because every time you get drunk, you run at the risk. If somebody's standing here, try this. How many of these girls are in a relationship? 
So the guy who's holding a little bit. Let's just try this, honey. Come on, let's get high. You like the guy? You want him to like you? You can stand up against that. Say, no, you want me, you want me straight. You want me clean. No, no, let's get high. Let's see. Chill, chill out. Let's lay back and relax here. The ultimate drug, seduction. Right you have a beer. You say to yourself, fear is harmless. That's called rationalization and justification of the use of the drug. Here goes step one. Let's have a beer. Let's have two. Let's have three. Let's try. Yeah, the guy, the boyfriend, you trust him, you like him. If you're going out with a couple of months, let's try it. It's a goof. It's a game for the drug. Now you like it. You try it. Smoke a little coke, a little coke, a little some pills. Rock a little ass. Look pretty close. You like it? You're an addict. Nobody <coughs> wants to buy that. Okay? Everybody, why? What happens to the addict? What happens to the human being? Says, ah, I like that cocaine. I like that marijuana. I like turpentine. I like the little dust. Now, if I said to anyone here, when you're five, seven, ten years old, here, here's some chocolate. Oh, they get you oh wow, this is great. I'll never do this again. The reversal was addiction. You tried the drug. You like it. You're going to do it again. Ah. If you don't need drugs, you don't like them. Cocaine is not the gross national product of Colombia because nobody likes it. It works. All drugs work. Femoral, Percodent, Percocet, Valium, Xanax, Halcyon, Plaxico. They all work. If you like it, too, it's really good. I'm going to control it. You're going to be that exception to the rule. That one person in the main who can control. Problem. Doesn't happen. I haven't found that one person yet. I like it stage of addiction. I can handle it. I don't like it high once in a while stage of addiction. I just do it with my girlfriend. I just do it weekend stage. Have a few beers and get chilled out. That's all. Once in a while is a treat stage of addiction. Just for treat. Tolerance plus frequency of use equals I need. I need it stage of addiction. It drops down the road with a second year high school, second year college. Well, that's a rule you won't go to college. You'll chill out and get a job, see? Just don't settle in for less. It's part of the disease. Get a week's pay because you figure you need the money to grab your stuff for your set street on weekends or whatever. Keep your girlfriend interested in her, keep her high, keep giving her what she wants. Moral behavior is gone. Ambition is gone. Gold, green, qualified. You're just chilling out, living for today. Now, the idea that stage of addiction will lead you to one of three places, and one of three places only. And never forget this. Try it, you like it, you like it. Your body holds a tolerance to it. Tolerance plus frequency of use equals I need it. I need it, you die, you go insane, you go to jail. Most of you three hours. You die through impaired decision making, you drive, you drink, you drive, go you hit a tree, you're dead. You get drunk, you trip over, trip off the stage, break your neck, you're still dead. Foreigner says you're a broken neck. Alcoholic loose broken neck. You want to do a little dust, do a little acid, you're gonna look at the boy walking down the street looking at a pretty red light. Well, oh, that's a pretty red light, man. You step off the curb, you run over by a bus, you still dead. I mean, acid's on the rise, dust is on the rise. I'm looking at this cute, looking pretty color. I see people who saw them looking pretty color. They did acid twice, three, four times, scared me to death. That's other people do. Watch other people do dust. PCP and other dust. Take scissors, take a shear, cut off the finger, watch the sauce bleed. Don't want to look at that ball. Hey, well, I can almost see the cells, man. Is it thoughts of behavior? 
You see? You're a degenerate. You're a loser on drugs. I lost it. It was an emotional power. That's why you do it. Insanity. Insanity is a very good part of it. You want to die. You're suicidal. You don't know how to get by. Yeah, you don't know how to live. And you go to jail. Uh-huh. If you notice where they go dealing, and steal, very illegal. But you wouldn't deal, and you say you wouldn't steal. Never broke a law in my life. But I did drugs. And then not only did I steal, I stole a lot. I used a gun. And then I was going to do time for our robberies. That scared me, so I decided to deal. That's the only two things, because drugs are expensive. At first, some jerk, some clown gives it to you. Whether it's boyfriend, a girlfriend, or acquaintance, or somebody trying to impress you. Friends don't give friends drugs. Acquaintances give jerks drugs. Yeah. Or on TV drugs. I said, yeah, let's try that. I'll try that. I'm not scared enough. I'll show off all my friends. You try it. You get them free the first half dozen times. Any more one here pays for the drugs the first time is a real jerk. I mean, you got to be making really good to do that. You get them all the brothers and sisters, friends, acquaintances hanging around, you get them. You don't pay for them. You don't want to give them to you. Then you have to start paying. See, you go back to that person and say, listen, let's stop your room and have lunch and more of that. Oh, yeah, I said, well, I'm not involved. Give me some money. I will get this song. And you start stealing from your friends. When I was using, if you were my best friend, I would have stole your wallet, and then I would have helped to look for it. <laughs> and say, look, you lose your wallet, it's fine. Oh, here's your wallet. Oh, my cash is gone. Wow, somebody must have quit here. And what is it to generate? Discover your ability to don't know that you're a good person inside. You never know what that's out of you. Why? Because you decide you're going to handle life for yourself. There are rules and there are regulations in this world to pay attention to to keep you safe. And then you start getting bounced around a little bit emotionally. Your boyfriend dumps you, girlfriend dumps you, whatever. Talk to somebody. Your friends are for Talk to your best friend. Share your secrets with your best friend. They don't okay to do this loosely. One person. Be honest with one person. If anyone here has three friends in a life, Words to get, you know, and, and it's enough class and respect and trust and loyalty. I earn the respect and love and trust of three friends by the time the 60, you're doing so. I got two. I got two friends. My wife is in a row. And she friends are something. Friends are we really misuse the word friends. But they have a lot of fun. But a friend is somebody you can trust. Friends don't give you drugs. Friends help you. Friends stand behind you. Friends protect you. You gotta understand. You are the future of this country. You are what it's all about. I'm gonna be dead. And your problem. And this school will come to fruition when you're all 30, 35, 40 years old. I never dreamed I was gonna live with this old. I thought I'd be dead a long time ago. But you're it. You're going to change the way this country thinks. By that time, I'll be dead. You'll be the governor, and you'll be the doctors, and the lawyers, and the bosses, and the truck drivers. You'll be anything you want to be in this country. As long as you're honest, deal with your feelings, and have the strength to cooperate with other people, have the strength to get along with other people, and have the courage to ask for help along the way, because you will get all the help you can ask for. But when you ask for it, you must accept it. Now, anyone here wants to know if you're an addict? Very simple. How do you need users? Very simple. You don't have to go to anybody. You don't have to go any farther than where you're sitting. All you have to do, launch, or it's at the beginning, get on with yourself. Totally dead on with yourself. When you put your head on a pillow tonight, and you're alone with your own thoughts, ask yourself one question. Can I quit? Can I stop? If your brain rationalizes or justifies its use, now my point might not be to do it. Or I don't like it, and I'll just do a little bit, or I'll pass back, or I won't do a lot. I've said that. Cannot quit. You 
you need help. It does not get any better. Tolerance makes it worse. You need more of the same desire effect. You've already built it in stage one, two, three, or four. Can I quit? Can I stop? Quit means to cease and desist. You need help, go to counselor. Go to somebody, a teacher, a friend, a counselor, a parent. You can't do it stinky like that. Quit. Stop. You can't do that. If you haven't started, don't start. You are strength. Those of you who have not started, who live with being teased and everybody picking on you because you're not supposed to be cool, or you're uh, a jerk, or you're ugly, or you're whatever. Everybody, with all these darts and knives you throw at each other, are inside an emotional power. You people that are dealing with your life, straight, dealing with pain, the hurt, the rejection every day, you're growing. Your character is getting stronger, bigger, and better. The ones that are fluffing off, drinking and drugging, are losing slowly but surely every day of your life. Until you stop. And it's that simple. It doesn't get any simpler than that.
got asked for stuff. Well, it's something pretty possible. As I think I'm ready for it. I don't like it right now. Like, you only keep saying it now. Because like, you're the only one who gets to live with the whole life. That's the answer. That's kind of nice. Because you're the one that looks yourself. Oh, ice cream. Um, I don't know. I can't really look anything else on my hands. No, I I don't write time. I, I, <laughs> well, what I want to say is I think this was good uh, for Timberland to have someone like Mr. Sanderson because uh, it's like sports heroes. Important for a lot of kids in high school. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm more of an alcohol. Uh, a, I think there's a problem. I think, uh, yeah. Do you think there was some kid who had Right, and then what I just said.